round table. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Hand and Lock Prize Roundtable, a live discussion with some prize winners that I'm sure you're very eager to meet. But first of all, I'm just going to introduce myself. I'm Robert McCaffrey, and I spent the better part of 10 years working here at Hand and Lock, and now I'm a freelance art and fashion historian. And hopefully that means that I will be able to interrogate my lovely guests appropriately about their artistic endeavours. But we're also here to learn a little bit about their prize experience. And... Um, talking about that, I need to start this with a very, very important reminder. If you are watching this at home and you are interested in entering the prize in 2022, you have until midnight tomorrow. Midnight on the 31st of March, that's midnight GMT. And I'm telling you this now because you can also use a special discount code to get 30% off your entry. So if you are interested in, well, obviously you're interested because why would you be here? But if you're interested in entering this year, use code roundtable 22 for 30% off your entry. Now, now that that's all done, I'm going to introduce my guest. Hello, hello, hello. Um, starting, some of you will already be familiar, but I'd like to start with Lucy, Lucy Martin. Hello. Hello, Lucy. Hello, Robert. How are you? I'm very good. Good. I think everyone at home wants to know a little bit about your prize winning piece from last yeah. year and a little bit about your practice. So please go ahead and tell us. Yeah, so... Um my piece was um, the floral rosebow sculpture, so it was called The Preciousness of Life. That was the kind of title of the project. And it was based on stunt work, and there were also elements of like gold work in there, tambour beading, all sorts really, to kind of create these um, yeah, pieces that sat within glass stones, these terrariums, which were all inspired by my family and sort of my home. So during COVID, I moved home, and it was all sort of inspired by that. So yeah, my, my practice at the moment, so my sort of artistic practice, sort of my, my work is all sort of raised work flowers like nature and also there's like mineral pieces so it's kind of bringing nature and how do I emulate that through stitch and how do I sort of exploit the textures that are found in nature but through material choices techniques processes that sort of thing yeah so you've done geology yes effectively <laughs> you've also now gone to cover flowers but you started with one particular commission that was your yeah. first experience of silk shading yeah. and it was for your nana. Can you tell us about that? It was. So it was part of the um, part of my course at the Royal School of Needlework actually, but it was a piece that I designed specifically for her. So it was for my nana and it was based on my granddad's favourite flower. So my granddad's favourite flower is a yellow rose and we planted it in the garden and it's still going now and that when they bloom they the kind of heart shaped blooms, it's really pretty. And I wanted to kind of bring that through with silk shading and create a really beautiful piece for her and then I think since then it's blossomed, pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting because you really carried on in that vein yeah. and like once you found silk shading and once you found yeah, stump work you really, that became your thing. Now that you've maybe put behind some other techniques do you f still feel like there's a world to explore? Definitely, I think with sort of training in loads of different areas that, the thing that sort of excites me is combining them so sort of going for gold work and how you represent florals through kind of different patterns that you can create and silk shading I think always has like a little place in my heart because you can like it's it's bizarre because I, I really dislike drawing and I just like shading kind of in uh, an, an artistic sense but I think doing it with thread I can see it better in my mind and I think kind of studying petals taking flowers apart and then kind of reforming them through kind of sculptural embroidery is I just love it. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> um, if you are uncertain about any of the pieces that we're talking about, you can find them on the Hand and Lock website or obviously all the, these guys' Instagrams. Um, Rebecca, thank you. Welcome to, welcome to the round table. Um, you, all, you all studied at Royal School of Needlework, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. And prior to Royal School of Needlework, you were doing something else. Can you tell us uh, a little bit yeah. about that journey? So I worked in private banking for high net birth clients. So, mm, so no one here? <laughs> <laughs> Not that I know of. So. But yeah, it was very different. So I changed career when I was 13, 31. Um, so yeah, I got to a point in my banking career where I was not enjoying life and I just thought it's now or never. And it's a quite a switch from something that's so binary, numbers, to something that's limitless, creative. And particularly, I, I want you to tell us a little bit about your piece, Odyssey of Grief, because you threw everything at that. 
from a creative standpoint? Uh, yes, so it was a bit of an odd patch in my life when I uh, came up with the concept and when I was making the crowns. Um, I'd had a series of sort of unfortunate events that had all happened at once. So I had a couple of miscarriages quite close together and my husband wasn't very well and then my house burnt down all in the space of a couple of months. And this was also while you were studying? Uh, so yeah, this was while I was studying. I was in my final year at uni. I was a sort of a few weeks away from handing in and then um, the house fire sort of happened uh, out of the blue and I lost sort of 95% of my work for my original final major project, which was a bit tough. But, oh. um, so I had to have a little break from uni to sort of get my life in order. Oh. And then um, I was sort of trying to come up with a new concept for a new final major project so I was still sort of quite attached to last year's but I needed to start fresh and um, I was really struggling because I was trying to come up with sort of happy sort of themes and that wasn't how I was feeling at the time so I decided to just bite the bullet and make it about the sort of grieving process so the three different crowns that I made are sort of three different stages of grief that I went through so the first one was quite dark and down and I felt really low and the middle one Sort of represents the middle stage where you sort of go a bit defensive and spiky and try and wall yourself in and then the third one was sort of how much better I felt and how even though the house fire was bad actually positives did end up coming out of it so although it's a bit of a low subject to start hopefully it's a positive body of work. Well I think it's garnered you can... a lot of attention if nothing yeah. else and it's it's a very the pieces show a lot of embroidery diversity and talent so mm -hmm. they're kind of like your portfolio all wrapped up into one with yeah, a story they are it's quite difficult i think when you make a project that's very emotionally close to you because if people don't like it then it's i think it's harder to take if it's something that's really has an emotional link to you but everyone's been really kind and really positive which is lovely and a lot of people have said that they could look at them and understand like their own grief that they've had um, in life which is really if nothing nice. else it surely shows that some of these feelings are universal yeah I think especially when you do have you know a loss you can feel like you're really alone and so I think it's nice if you see that other people have had the same sort of feelings and people have come out the other side of it and life does go on now there's something else about you that I found quite fascinating you mm -hmm. have a type of synesthesia and that obviously yeah. impacts your creative output so can you tell us about that? Yes, so I have something called chromesthesia, which is uh, so it's a type of synesthesia. So my senses are a bit muddled in my brain, is the only way I can really describe it. So when I hear sounds, I see patterns and colours sort of in my mind involuntarily. I don't have any control over it. Um, so I play the piano and the violin, so whenever I'm playing music is probably when it's the strongest. And so certain songs have certain colours and certain patterns and set people's voices have certain colours and certain patterns and um, they change depending on people's moods. So I'm very good at telling when people feel sad. I oh, can tell from their voice. No, I'm very self-aware. <laughs> <laughs> um, did that play into your creative output while you were at the, art, the World School of Needlework? Yeah, definitely. So my second year I did a project uh, based around my nan and um, uh, the cut crystal that she gave me when she passed away and the colour scheme for my project was what her voice looks like so it was sort of blue, yellow, sort of cream and then in my first final major project before the house fire uh, that was all based around chromesthesia so, so yeah. that, that story ended with the fire and you had to start it again did, uh, but I mean I have to say from personal experience when my mm -hmm. computer decides to shut down and I lose so much work mm -hmm. I hate that moment yeah. but what I usually do afterwards is usually better so yeah. I do find myself going Maybe it was meant to be, but yeah. it's very hard to say that when your house was on fire. So yeah, I think once you've got a bit of distance from it, it does tend to, when they say one door shuts, another one opens, so it did work out for the best in the end. Brilliant. And last but not least, hello Kate. Hello Robert. Thank you for joining <laughs> us. Um, uh, Kate, you also went to the Royal School of Needlework and uh, you were also a textile artist and an, uh, also another prize winner. In fact, there's a lovely video on um, Kate's Instagram where she wins the prize and she just turns to the camera and gives this amazing face. <laughs> um, but you won that for your piece, Lockdown O'Clock, yes. which, um, which everyone that, when I was taking people around to it, everyone loved, everyone wanted to stop it, everyone wanted to scan the QR code. Can you tell us a little bit about how that was your final piece at the Royal School of Needlework, but also how you adapted it for the prize? Well, so Lockdown O'Clock. Um, I'd like to be able to tell a story with my work, and it does that, I believe. Um, so 
when I'm sort of thinking of an idea, it tends to pop into my head and, and be quite persistent. Um, so I had this idea of a flying clock, and that had been literally flying around in my brain for a little while. Um, but when I, when I came across the brief for the hand and lock, um, um, I was, because the whole thing about time as well, you know, this clock, you know, it fascinates me. Um, but from the brief, um, I was able to sort of take out pop out Janus, who is the god of time um, and duality. And that really did help me sort of start to kind of like prise it out of my brain and into something tangible. Um, but uh, lockdown o'clock, I mean, it tells the story of lockdown, you know, as um, a lot of people experienced it. I mean, I was lucky. Um, I didn't know anybody who was ill or was, um, you know, negatively affected by it. So I was just literally at home in a flat in East London <laughs> with my <laughs> lovely other half. The tiny world becomes very small. Um, and during that time, um, I mean, I love the city. Um, I, I say I'm from London, uh, in London rather. Um, and it, it's just reflecting my environment of the time. And, and it, because everything slowed down to this incredible pace where the clock on the wall doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, whereas like going out at night and going, oh, it's a full moon again. That means another month has gone by and we're yeah. still here. We're still doing this. But then it was just like looking at the beauty of, of everyday things like pigeons, you know, that those lovely wings or pigeon wings. We've got an infestation on our balcony, I'm afraid. So. <laughs> um, I mean, things it's going it's a dove. And dove. I, I, I'm always like, someone recently said to me, it's a grey dove. And I was, no, no, it's a, it's a pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is a pigeon. <laughs> They're all beautiful in the room. Yes, they, they are. Just like, shoo. <laughs> um, but yes, and then, you know, my view for all that time was just like the boring Stratford High Street, which has got town hall and tower blocks, and, and that is all there represented, including all the growing things from the balcony. And the front of it is a moon phase, so that became my marker of time, if you like. And everybody more elongated. <laughs> yes, it's much months. Yes, slower. That months. was one of the things about yes. the prize. When, uh, the prize, sorry, the lockdown. When we went into it, we were like, "Is it a, a few days? Is it yes, a few it's weeks?" Two weeks yeah. And I mean, we look back now, and it's like that was most of a year. Yeah. And, and yeah. For, for some people, more than a year. Yeah. But again, it's it seems to just gone by mm. in the blink. Yeah. I remember getting sent home from university and them telling us that it was going to be two weeks and that's that we right, should just pack and then yeah. I went home to, to live with my family in the Peak District and then two weeks later I had to come back to my flat with pack the car full of stuff and then go back up north and we stayed up north until October. Yeah. Well, you were all creating through the pandemic when mm. the prize this time last Gosh, it's confusing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When you entered the prize, um, it was lockdown. Did, did that whole situation of like, well, what else am I going to do impact your choice to enter? I don't think so. I think I was always kind of planning on entering, but I think it's it's it kind of framed everything in a whole different way, and it set th so the context for my work just completely changed because I wanted to kind of bring it. it was, I think people's priorities shifted, and I wanted to reflect that my my priorities through sort of my final pieces and it was what was important to me at that, that time it's like my family spending time at home and just like the things that are the most important to me and reflecting that through embroidery which is kind of what you were saying it's yeah. like kind of bringing in those bits that actually the kind of outside external stuff that doesn't really matter in the everyday and then just kind of honing it down to what's really important I think is yeah why well, well, I think yeah all of our pieces do really well I know you, you obviously had compound dramas mm. on top of dramas on top of dramas and hopefully at no point ran out of toilet paper <laughs> I mean it, it, but it, it sounds like you still resolved it to be something that was beautiful and uplifting with a darker edge but from a standpoint yours must have taken an astonishing amount of time yeah they were they were quite intense um halfway through the gold one and i'm not gonna lie i did think why have i done that <laughs> <laughs> um, sure yeah um but it's, it's amazing what you can do with the help of caffeine if, if you need to so i think it helps as well um because some of my work experience i'm a freelance handy and we tend to do quite long hours mm -hmm. at um at work when it's busy so I, I sort of came at it from the point of view well if you can do that sort of shift at work then you can do that sort of shift at home and also with it being locked down it's easy to not get distracted because you're not missing out on sort of social events and yeah. going out to the pub and all that sort of fun thing it was just very much in my I was lucky I had a studio in my flat so I could go in there shut the door 
I that guess. is all. Mm-hmm. One thing that I often mm-hmm. hear embroiderers talk about is how embroidery is a little bit akin to meditation. Mm-hmm. And obviously we're always, I mean, rather than work, I will hoover, wash the dishes, mm-hmm. clean behind the TV. But when you actually have a brief and when you have something that you have to get on with, it must be very motivating. Uh, your piece, I like the fact that it's quite an urban idea and you painted this picture mm-hmm. or embroidered this scene, if you like, of you in, in quite a confined space that could otherwise be oppressive. But it sounds like your embroidery was more an act of meditation and relief and expression. Um, Yes, in a way. I mean, uh, when you stitch, um, you do kind of enter this meditative state. Um, you know, you some kind of get up in the morning, brush your teeth, comb your hair if you're lucky, and then before you know it, it's night time, you know, and you've been stitching all of that time. So um, it is a meditation. I mean, it, I'm fascinated by tiny, beautiful worlds, if you like. I mean, so that's, that's kind of what it also um, is doing. Um, yeah, so it, it is. Editing the whole pandemic yes. experience down into, into one something art. small and, and lovely you know yeah. even though it was not a lovely thing <laughs> you've all done it in your own mm. personal expression and it's not always necessarily about the pandemic but those are the times we lived through and mm. that's what you were working on at the time i want to roll the clock back a little bit we've talked a little bit about what you did before embroidery mm-hmm. but kate what did you do before you chose to become an embroiderer Ooh, so I've got a whole 30 years <laughs> of being a graphic designer. Um, so I worked in magazines and books. Um, I was the art director of, um, of those places that I worked. Um, and uh, so that's what I did. Um, so, you know, nine to five job, a um, few long hours, churning out magazines, working with... So back when you were yeah. doing that, did you have much of a notion of embroidery or even of hand and lock prize? Um, not hand and lock, I didn't know they existed, I'm afraid. <laughs> That's fine. Um, embroidery, um, those who remember me, because I, I left my last job um, on a magazine about 10 years ago, and it was the day after my mortgage got paid off. <laughs> Sold. <laughs> but they will remember me. Um, now and again, I, I, did, I, I brought in like a, a cross stitch that I was doing. That was it. I mean, I'd done the odd cross stitch here and there, and they will probably remember me sitting there at my desk at lunchtime, Putting a few X's in badly. <laughs> well, they do say yeah. cross stitch is like a gateway drug to embroidery. It certainly yeah. is, absolutely. <laughs> you have to do something. So, yeah. if, if anyone's yeah. looking where to start, clearly yeah. it is but cross stitch. Yeah. But then, the, what I found interesting was obviously your previous life was creative. But very much in a digital kind of two-dimensional sphere, yes. and now your your creativity is much more tangible with embroidery. Do you feel like you're expressing a lot of the same muscles? Absolutely. Um, it feels like what um, the, the way of thinking, um, the storytelling. I mean, we talk about art being a storyteller, and um, that's very important to me in my process. Um, graphic design um, is you have to tell a story. You have to be able to lay something out. So here's your headline, and you're telling, and you're telling the story of the pictures, etc. So that's how my brain works. That's how it's been honed to work. Um, but so going into hand embroidery is like a completely different exploration, but it's still, I need to be able to um, create something, and then if you look closer, you will get some more detail, you will get um, hopefully delightful, or a story of some sort, so that's what I'm, I'm drawing, I'm not just doing stuff because it's pretty, I, I, you know, plenty of other people can just do pretty things. I well, you take the conceptual box yeah. and definitely, <laughs> it's gonna tell us. and it, it, it's something yeah. that I think all, all of your pieces are something that you can keep going back to and enjoy more, enjoy something new, mm-hmm. and I think that comes with embroidery as well, just because it is no disparagement against people who paint or sculpt, well, well, less so sculpture, but the paintbrush stroke, there's an element of the paint's doing its own thing, the canvas is doing its own thing, gravity is at play, but with embroidery, every single thread, every single bead, you are in control of its exact placement. So this is definitely a medium where artistic skill is required. I I want to know, particularly with yourself, Mm -hmm. going back not many years, so where the enjoyment or the desire to be an embroiderer came from? So for me, I think I've always sort of grown up around textiles. So my mum was, um, she's now like a CEO of an of a education trust in Derbyshire, but she used to make, she used to be a textile teacher. So she used to kind of make 
wedding dresses and prom dresses and things so people used to come around to my house and obviously be fitted for the prom dresses and I used to think when I was about four years old like oh wow they look like princesses like I want to I want to look like a princess and I want to I want to do princess things basically as a four-year-old and then that kind of grew into actually I can make these because mum does it so I'm I'm going to do that basically so I started studying textiles and then I think kind of worked out that I didn't want to make the pieces I wanted to make them sparkly that was kind of my thought process in terms of going into embroidery and then explored it further did a, an open day at the RSN and walked in and it's that kind of feeling that you can't describe of this is what I want to do like this is I can't I can't really put it into words but it's just knowing kind of within yourself that that is exactly what you want to do and this is exactly where you need to be and on the interview they had gave me a place and burst into tears I was like this is this is just bonkers but I think ever since then it's just been kind of doing what I love every day so yeah but fun. also the, the RSN as a, a a place at Hampton Court it, you feel the I don't know maybe the pressure of history or it's the bonkers. greatness it is I mean, you, you were all there what was yeah. your experience coming from a finance background because I feel like that <laughs> probably was was quite a shock it was a bit to be honest um because I was at work the day before I started <laughs> at the RSN so I went from Gracie. being like dressed in a suit full face of makeup to turning up at the RSN the next day and um it was a bit of a shock to the system mm. to be honest it took me a while to settle and I think because I didn't come from an art background I I was very frazzled I remember the first day our tutor sphere came around with a piece of charcoal for us to do some design work and gave it to me and I didn't know what it was and I remember saying to the lady sitting next to me I was like what is this <laughs> and um, she was like it's charcoal and I thought oh no what have I done I don't even know what the don't even know what the materials are but what inspired that if 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 you Mm. went into that so blind what made you go this is for me i think it sort of goes back to when i was at school i was quite academic i was quite lucky and i remember doing my options my gcse's and writing like art drama textiles and i remember my form tutor taking my form and crossing them all out and saying no 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 you can't do this you're you're academic so you need to do double signage you need to do history me to do you know all of these extra things and I remember saying oh it's not what I want to do and she called my mum and said she's put all of these arty subjects down and she can't do that she needs to do academic ones and my mum was like yeah fine and so that sort of carried on into college because I didn't have any of the GCSEs I needed to do any sort of art options and that's sort of how I ended up in banking and then I had a long commute into work like two hours each way and I used to get so bored and I really resented like four hours of my day wasted so I started stitching and knitting and doing all sorts of things like that and then I ordered a book um, on gold work and I didn't realise that it was written by someone who went to the RSN and I thought oh there's a there's a place you can go to do it as a degree and then I booked my um, open day like Lucy and um I thought, yeah, this is where I need to be, and then, I yeah. think I think a lot of people do find themselves on the wrong path and don't think that there's anything they can do about it. Mm. I mean, obviously, it, it helps <laughs> if that first path pays off your mortgage, yeah, and that's got to be the goal, but I think that's, there's, I know from speaking to people um, in and around the prize that there are lots of people who this is a later choice, and it's often quite a contrast. You know, people have been very businessy in their first career, mm. but they've, there's been this suppressed or quiet need to be creative yeah. um how does it actually feel now that you've done a complete 180 yeah. and you are now a creative freelancer in demand i love it it's, <laughs> it's the best decision i ever made it was terrifying at the time because you have the sort of natural thing oh i've losing a job that i've taken years to build up and i've worked really hard for what if it doesn't work out and what if i can't get work at the end of it mm. but i think maybe being an older student was definitely had its positives because I think you have a bit more life experience and so I need to sort of take opportunities as and when they came up and it's definitely sort of held me in good stead work-wise going, going forward. And so you're probably more confident second time yeah, round. Yeah, you are and yeah. I think you've just got a bit more life experience and also if you, I think if you've worked a full-time job that you hate then you're so excited to be at uni that you don't waste sort of any any time. Well with Lucy I think we're at the opposite end of the spectrum and I have to ask you a question where where do you think what you're doing now will progress to and how do you hope your career will be in 20 years? I have no idea. I mean, I think it's 
my career goal You're was to win. In the bank. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think a lot of people have similar experiences. Though, cause I remember being hugely discouraged to go into anything creative. I think on a school level, it makes me really angry because I think a lot of st- I think it's a push towards academia, and it's like, well, co- creativity is as much of a valid route as anything else, and. I think now I'm doing what I love every single day and my career goal so on the first day of the RSN and Freshers Week we had a tour with you at Hand and Lock and I remember thinking this is really cool like I definitely want to kind of explore this as an option. <laughs> she thought I was cool. <laughs> <laughs> definitely but um, yeah my goal was to win a Hand and Lock prize in my career so I've picked that one off the list twice over already so it's just kind of now I'm just I'm I just want to do embroidery forever basically that's kind of the goal (laughs) well i'm going to bring something contentious up here that i wasn't sure whether i wanted to bring up but um i I read an article online about Mm -hmm. the fire that that yeah but i went to the comments underneath Mm -hmm. and someone had responded to what you'd what you'd said when you were being interviewed um and uh, and they seemed incredulous that there was even such a thing Mm -hmm. as an embroidery degree yeah Mm -hmm. i've got a lot of um sort of odd looks from people when I said oh I'm leaving my job to go back to university and they were like oh what are you doing and I said oh I'm going to do a degree in hand embroidery and I found actually particularly with men were very much like oh that's ridiculous You're, you'll never be able to make a living out of that like I said I wanted to go to university to do a degree and something really sort of frivolous and um, I used to get quite cross with that because I'm right, sort of a fairly sensible person and I did do some research to make sure that there were career opportunities available, I didn't just it's sort it's of on a website that says something like 25 of the most ridiculous degrees, and it's on there. Yeah. And I looked at it and was like, That's rude, along with like <laughs> Harry Potter stuff, yeah, studies like, like David that. Beckham studies and things. That's just like yeah. it's great. I like, think, if nothing else, the people in this room hopefully prove that there's more. it's an art, yeah, and yeah. that yeah. there's a creative art, but the people are interested because you all receive commissions, is that right? Yeah. 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 So people are wanting to buy what you produce. Yeah, definitely. That's no different to someone who's a painter, someone who's a sculptor. I use a bit of snobbery as well to do with textiles. I feel like it has a sort of a lower reputation within the art industry, and I don't think that's yeah. fair. I think at historically all. it's because it's been associated with women. Yeah, I women think it is a mis- bit misogynistic, to be honest. I think that has that sort of attachment to it, and I hope sort of going forward, especially with social media and obviously the World School of Media Work has a really high profile that that will start to change and it's seen as a sort of valid and worthwhile art form and especially with the Hands and Lock Prize yeah. that definitely helps to sort of promote it. So. Well I think the exhibition this last year where there were people who were very very firmly established and then there were also the fashion pieces and then there were the entrants as well, I think it really allowed people to see that the, the standards are hugely high but there's also a real level of conceptual creativity as well there was also the Broderers Guild exhibition that I that didn't we, you, you had a piece yeah. exhibited yes yeah. yeah, I had a piece yeah. and sold my piece and you yeah. sold your piece <laughs> well I, I went around that and what I found really interesting was some of the pieces if they were hung in the tape next door mm. no one would question it it was mm. a piece of art yeah. it was deeply conceptual it was very clever and it should be being sold for millions upon mm. millions of pounds but as I walked around I did hear some people going oh that's expensive yeah. yeah. Look at how much time it takes to create this embroidery versus Damien Hurst's dots, you know, which aren't even done by him, they're done mm. by someone else. So, yeah, there's inherent value in embroidery mm. and skill. So, to anyone at home who doesn't agree, <laughs> we got you. Um, I did actually want to talk a little bit about the process because you all would entered, you all read the brief, you, except yourself, all had the experience of being mentored. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your mentoring process and whether that changed your final piece? Yeah, um, I was really lucky actually because my mentor was a lady that I sort of already had a relationship with, uh, Sarah from the Golden Hind. Sarah Rochdor, um, yep, yeah. Um, and um, so I sort of met her in the past because a lot of my work is very heavy gold work um, and um, especially with the gold work, I mean, I'm sure you remember from university um, mm-hmm. that you're always ordering things from there. and. Um, yeah, so I was really pleased when I saw that she was my mentor and um, at the time sort of she came into my project it was mostly done um, but it was really nice to get someone else's opinion on 
the bits that she thought were successful and I was having some trouble working out how to finish the crowns to sort of a really high standard like the edging and trying to locate some specialist materials I couldn't find leather thin enough basically to back my crown so she was really helpful with um, suggesting a few different places that I could try from there so for the people at home, um, if you get through the first round of the prize, at the second stage you are allocated a mentor who, who's hopefully going to be able to guide you in some way. They can be quite hands-on, they could be hands-off. Um, but also I think as creatives you do, particularly through the early stages, rely upon different mentors of different types. I know you didn't have a, um, you had a different mentor that kind of steered and helped you yes. at the RSN. Who was that and how did they help you? Uh, the lovely Marg Dyer. Oh, bless you, Marg. <laughs> um, she's a, a fantastic, uh, she's a tutor. Uh, she works in the studio, a professional hand embroiderer um, of uh, probably 25 years or more, possibly. She looks very young, um, <laughs> experience. Um, so she was my mentor. Um, and um, she she was fantastic. She supported me in not just like kind of a technical way. You know, like how am I going to make these wings stick up? They're a bit big for some work. And, um, and she answered that question. Um, but kind of philosophical way, she really supported me too. Um, in that, um, I remember asking her, said, "Do you think these wings are too big for this clock?" <laughs> and she thought for a moment and said. I don't think anybody's made any rules about how big, <laughs> how big the wings should be on carbon. <laughs> so <laughs> don't worry about it. You know. But it's, it's also, I mean, the, the process of toing and froing, having somebody to talk to, because there were times I had a lot of doubt about it. You know, it's like, is this just like the most ridiculous piece of work <laughs> anybody has ever done? And, um, and she kind of talked me down, you know, as well, out of my, you know, sort of... In, um, and she's just like so kind and she was saying that this is your piece um, you know, it's, it's not actually going to be marked by anybody <coughs> it'll be entered to a competition and and that's that but you know it is an expression of of you you know mm. so um, you, know, you believe in it you know you do, do it to the best of your ability um, and so it was just all of those things is my you know, just holding my hand you know, she was not directing me to do certain things in any way at all it was uh, sort of, what do you think if I do this? And then she would, you know, answer me. So she was just like fantastic, supportive, lovely sister. That's <laughs> and that's how it should be. I think with yeah. this year as well, yeah. with the prize mentors, if you end up with a mentor, you can kind of get out of that process what you put into it um, hopefully and don't be afraid because you know they've signed up to be mentors of this competition for a reason they do want to support you and guide you and and maybe help shape your work so you win but obviously there's a bit of push and push back I'm sure you know not everything that was suggested you adopted and I'm sure likewise yeah, it was really handy as well, obviously, because we did make our pieces in isolation completely. We were sort of very shut off, so it was important, I think, to have a outside third opinion yeah. sort of to come in. And because um, I, I don't know about you guys, but I did feel very sort of shut in my little studio, and that was that was it without any sort of. That's one of the things I like about the prize that it's an opportunity for people who've often worked in isolation for so long on a project mm -hmm. to actually get to see each other face to face and go, look, there are other people like me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you do have doubts at two in the morning, you think, oh, oh yeah. is, this, is this going right? And it's, I mean, it's nice to have it's to talk when, people. When you don't have it, so I think it's professional feedback as well is like mm -hmm. hugely useful because obviously like me moving back home, the only people I have are like my parents who are obviously extremely supportive, but it's my dad picking up a gold sequin and being like, is this gold work? Because it's gold. I'm like, no. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there was just kind of and obviously they're going to like pretty much love everything I do because they are my parents. But that, that they were the only sort of face-to-face -face direct feedback that I was having consistently. I think it's really important to get that sort of professional external feedback of people that know about embroidery. <laughs> no, absolutely. I think as well, um, I, I, people in all sorts of different industries want feedback. But I think as you enter this embroidery mm -hmm. process, particularly the prize, knowing that if you get through to the second round, someone should be giving you mm -hmm. feedback. But... I think this is for all of you. It would be interesting to see how your experiences differed from first signing up to that moment when you first hear that you're going through to the second round and just what your journeys were. I think I'll start with you, please. So I signed up and didn't hear anything back and I had to bring the pieces to hand and lock, which is obviously like terrifying on the tube. I was like, I don't want to do it. It's too scary. I think you brought them back, actually. I did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're sending you pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I've, I've made it to Waterloo. <laughs> 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 so in fact, yeah. 
And um, yeah, I remember finding out about it. I had um, actually a really horrible industry experience where I worked with a client who was really just awful to work with and really, really condescending and um, ended up not paying me for the work that I did. It was a really, really horrible experience. Um, I was like, not going to let it ruin my day. I'm just going to sit on South Bank. Like, I don't want to. I don't want it to affect me in any way. And the email came through that I'd won two prizes, and it was like that could not have been more perfect timing. And it was the best kind of validation because I think as soon as within the industry as well, especially at that time, I was just starting, and it was the first sort of initial feedback that I received. And I was thinking, gosh, like this isn't okay. And then sat on South Bank and was like, no, I am. I am quite good at what I do. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's the bad. best kind of validation. Yeah. But of course, the way you won the prize because it was an associate award, you yeah. were notified by email. But you two. You have to you have to stand there and wait for your name to hopefully be called like the Oscars, <laughs> but no flying fists. So how how was how was that being at the event, being at the exhibition? It was it was really lovely. My main aim when I entered the competition was that I wanted to get to a finalist because I'd been to visit the Hand and Love exhibitions from previous years, mm-hmm. and that was. So obviously winning a prize is, is wonderful, but my main aim was, oh, if I can get to the finals and I get to have my work displayed. Um, and so that, I was really chuffed when I found out that I'd got to the finals. I was like, yes, that's, that's brilliant. And um, so, yeah, the sort of coming to the prize was sort of a, a bit of a bonus. I wasn't really expecting anything. And it was lovely. I was walking around with my husband and some friends. And, um, and then I thought, oh, I, there's a chance I might win something. But it sort of came as a afterthought because my main aim was really to get to exhibit my work and have it on display and for people to see it, especially alongside some of the artists that you really admire, like Karen Nichols' work, I've loved hers ever since I started uni, and to be able to have it exhibited in the same yeah, room, in the room. Room. Yeah, room. that was super exciting, and then, yeah, when I got my name called, I was, I was very pleased, so... Yeah. With yourself, I, I mean, your pieces were actually exhibited together. And, oh, and I, I, yeah, <laughs> I was taking people around and, and telling them little stories and encouraging them to take a little look. I mean, how was it to just have your piece exhibited, first of all, but then that night, how was it to have your name called? <laughs> that night, oh my God, I'll never forget it. It was like one of <laughs> the second happiest day of my life, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, so I mean, obviously I was delighted, you know, I mean, I've only been seriously stitching for five years and to be a finalist was just like, I just like nearly fell over and, and then they, they tell you in the same email, don't tell anyone. I was like, oh, come on! You're a finalist. So, um, and then later on, I found out I won the um, Golden Silver Wire drawers on, so it's a vaccine. So you knew so you'd won something. I won something. You and it was at that thing. point that I decided I need to go and get my makeup and done, and because <laughs> <laughs> I will walk on the stage once, you know. So, um, but then on that night, it was, I couldn't believe it. I mean, it's just the names are being called out, and then it just, and then they called mine. You know, it, it really was. It was. <laughs> it must be very, yeah, very validating. And I think yeah. for both of you as well, to have gone from some other career to this career, you need that validation. Yes, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And it really felt like all the, uh, yeah, because the kind of worry and the self-doubt, you know, that goes away. You sort of think, at my age, starting a new career like this, um, and for a small world of embroidery, there's an awful lot of people in it who are mm. so excellent at what they do and the, the love and the passion and time they put into it. Mm. But to be able to actually, you know, this year we've given you that prize, you know, for, and it's just incredibly validating. And I'm so grateful. <laughs> well, Thank you. Well, the year that you entered, the brief was digital doppelgangers in a virtual world. Now, we know that the projects that you're often working on are your final pieces at, at university, and you either have to adapt them or you have to draw out the digital mm-hmm. element of it. And in this case, digital doppelgangers wasn't strictly speaking digital. We didn't expect people to be embroidering pixels, although I think some did. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea was to explore the multifacetedness of your life in lockdown in particular, the fact that there was a version of us online on a Zoom call, there's another version of us shopping around Asda and another version at home with our families. We wear different masks. And I think, you know, you have different crowns which mm-hmm. seem to reflect that. You seem to reflect the people in your life in mm. different objects. Just broadly speaking, I mean, chat amongst yourselves, please, I'll have a rest. Well, how did that brief and how did briefs generally inspire you? 
I think with it, it's it's kind of taking the brief, but not don't read it too literally. I think it's really important. Well, f- for me particularly, I read it and thought digital doppelgangers that doesn't relate to me at all. But then when you sort of unpick it and you can actually, I mean, I don't know how you just sort of felt about it, but it was kind of it, how how you can take it and not necessarily. Yeah, don't, don't read it exactly as it is. Read it in a kind of way that you can interpret it. And that, the way that I sort of looked at it, it was like I was almost creating a doppelganger of nature and also so through the pieces and then also kind of representing my family and also a kind of rejection of the digital world as well because it's so important with hand embroidery, I think, to see it in person. It's just a completely different mm. kind of thing. And obviously there's like social media and you can see it online and there's websites and all the rest of it. But I think nothing quite beats that tactile being able to see because the loads of people at the exhibition they come up to me and they're like oh I've seen it on Instagram but it's so much smaller in real life and it's like yeah you don't get that appreciation until you do actually see it and you can walk around it exactly yeah you know it's it's a three-dimensional piece yeah you mentioned social media now that's Mm -hmm. interesting when it comes to your piece yeah so um I think the briefs are really well written for the for the prizes because they're there's a lot of scope they're not particularly narrow you, you know there's lots of different elements that you can bring in so with mine for example uh, when I first read it I did think well I'm not sure if my pieces are gonna gonna work but then I thought about the social media aspect and I had a look at my social media feeds from the time when all of my life calamities happened at once and I there, there's no evidence that everything was going horribly wrong. It all looked like I was having a lovely time. We knew you were going in heaven. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's no indication that I was having a really difficult time. And part of the reason I started creating the crowns was because I wanted there to be sort of a visual representation of grief because you don't know when someone's suffering from grief. You know, you, you feel like you're sort of riddled with invisible wounds that nobody can see. And I feel like that links in quite nicely with social media because people do put this pretend version of their life on social media. Nobody posts a picture of their house and it's a mess. Nobody posts a picture of them when they've, you know, got out of bed and their hair's picking up. Smile. Yeah, it's, it's sort of like a pretend veneer that everything's fine and, and I think um, I really linked in with that aspect of the grief of the, as the digital doppelgangers because I think um, I think if you rely too much on social media you, you don't form sort of proper emotional connections with people and it can be quite isolating because everyone thinks you're fine yeah and you're not i can't help but think about how frida carlo obviously painted the the column and other paintings about her troubles physical mm-hmm. illnesses etc and you know how are those things received at the time to how they are later they do give us a little bit of a historical context of illness at that time but mm-hmm. i think you were probably pointing your your finger at how mental health is on the tip of everyone's tongue at the moment, mm-hmm. but really it's still invisible and yeah. something that we try and sweep under the carpet, even yeah. though we're all talking about positive mental yeah. health. Yeah. I also found it really difficult with the whole miscarriage side of things because I still think there's sort of a taboo subject about it, so I'm quite matter of fact and I'm quite direct and I'll happy to ask about things like that. But people would say, Oh, well, I haven't seen you for a while, like, are you okay? And I'd say, Oh, unfortunately, I had a miscarriage, and people would sort of clam shut with panic and sort of go, oh, um, right, okay. Mm -hmm. And I think, so when I wanted to make the crowns, I wanted that to sort of be an aspect of it because so many women suffer from miscarriage and I don't think it should be something that we should sort of hide in the cupboard behind. Two of my friends didn't know that either of them had had miscarriages and then when they finally got the opportunity to talk, you know, it was... It, it was a, an opportunity to get so much out there. Yeah. It's a conversation that needs to be promoted, and art is one of the areas yeah. where we can promote conversations. Yeah, so many people, um, when they asked me about the inspiration behind it, and I said it's a lot, had a shared experience, and said, oh, I've had one or two, or my mum or my sister. And also, I think, you know, your partner as well, like my husband, it started a lot of conversations with other sort of partners of people that I knew who said, oh, yeah, my wife, and how they felt about it and stuff. So I think it is it's important, I hope, that it sort of promotes conversation. Besides conversation, was the process of embroidery cathartic? And this is for all of you as well, because I know you were going through grief, but you guys were going through another, were we first, second, third lockdown? I don't know what we were up to at that stage. But was it cathartic? Definitely, definitely. Yeah, massively. I feel like, um, I actually did, uh, in the first lockdown, another embroidery, which was a, uh, a memorial to the covid pandemic and it was a, it's a white work angel um, uh, but it's got a mask on and Pugin. it's got it's a Pugin angel uh, no that's a no I've got a thing about things with wings obviously oh, okay. angels yeah no there's another one it's in white work um, that one was gold work um, so there's the memorialisation of it so 
in a way, it feels like the most incredible, momentous thing has we've all just been through it, mm-hmm. and we're allegedly out of the other end, sort of thing. You think, you know, is that it? You know, is that, oh, we should be memorialising. I mean, I saw on the news yesterday they want to make the thing on the um, opposite Parliament, the, the, the yeah, well, COVID war with all hearts on it, mm-hmm. something permanent. Um, I think so, all of the pieces yeah. are artefacts of this time, yes. and we probably won't be able to see it now, but you know, artists and historians of the future, when they look back on these objects, mm. they will be imbued with what we've been through, mm. which the, in ways that we can't even see now. It's um, like when I did, say, so during, I think, uh, talking again about that isolation kind of thing, I did the NHS embroidery challenge during yes. lockdown, and I think that was a huge thing for me in terms of the community, so I started it and was just like we're never going to get any submissions like there might be like five because there are people that I know that I was like jiving on messenger like please just make one just so that it's not awkward and then within the first day we had about nine I was thinking this is potentially going to be bigger than we think it is I think there's like been 270 now and it's just like they they come in and I keep getting these stories and it's this sense of community and togetherness that especially within the embroidery community like you were saying it's like a such a it's it's like a world within itself you think it's so niche but as soon as you get in it there's quite a lot of people doing it and the community and they were just so supportive and hearing other people's experiences and knowing that kind of not everyone everyone was sort of going through a similar thing but everyone was going through it in a different way and hearing again that each piece had its own there was one that had Bristol Hospital in the background because someone had just been in to have a baby in Bristol Hospital and they were messaging me about it and it was just so nice to hear that like other people exist outside of my house and they were creating so someone just had a baby and had time to do an yeah. <laughs> 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 you heard that right yeah, <laughs> um, yeah that would be multiple <laughs> while she's pushing just <laughs> embroidering away um, I, I want to return to the actual prize exhibition now obviously we lost the whole year because of lockdown but when we finally had the exhibition we had two years worth of work we had fashion and we had textile arts your pieces were exhibited in the very next room to mm-hmm. fashion garments. Uh, uh, more than anything, I think I wanted to find out, uh, some of you have worked in fashion as well as, as artists. Um, if you think there's a lot to be learnt from art that you can apply in your textile art and vice versa, I'll start with you. Yeah, I definitely think so. Um, I mainly work sort of in fashion for freelancing and um, it's there's so much crossover between art and fashion. I don't think they're separate categories really, like where does one start and the other finishes. Um, and um, I've, I've learnt a lot actually from my freelancing career. Um, obviously when you do a degree or if you do any technical study, you're sort of taught one way and then you're encouraged to explore. And then if you come here from the other side from sort of industry experience, then you, you get a lot of sort of problem solving and uh, ways around things and practical knowledge like how the do you actually... Yeah, you Yeah, that you do, mm-hmm. that you have to do in a pinch when something goes horribly wrong. And obviously you don't necessarily have that at university because you're in a lot more of a controlled environment environment so I think the two definitely cross over and I think it should be encouraged. You've both worked on recent collections for Alexander McQueen I don't know how much you can say about that but what's that experience of being in such a high profile designer's studio? Um, it has a little crossover with banking, ironically. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you're in sort of a high net worth industry because if you make a mistake in sort of higher net worth banking, if you press the wrong button, you've potentially lost millions of pounds. And obviously if you're working for a sort of luxury brand, if you make a mistake on a garment or a dress that's potentially worth sort of hundreds of thousands of pounds, it, the pressure can be quite intense. But I really love it. And I think you have, or I certainly had in my mind a sort of um, idea of what fashion would be like, sort of devil wears Prada, everyone would be mean and, you know, no one would be friendly. And it's not been like that at all um, everyone's really lovely and it's quite a niche environment I think, like freelance and embroideries all sort of tend to know each other so it's lovely going to different jobs and seeing people who you know and who you recognize mm-hmm. and I think when you're freelance as well you get to work for lots of different brands and you see how different brands approach different things which is really lovely you also said though that that 
the work that you did for the prize mm -hmm. has kind of gained you a little bit of notoriety within fashion. Is, would that be fair to say? I think certainly within the embroidery world. So um, if I meet a new person who I've not worked with before and they say all sorts of like, what do you do? And I say, oh, I, I make sort of giant sculptural embroidered crowns. People do sort of go, oh, I've seen your seen your work through the hands and lock prize, which is really lovely. So rather than having to get your Instagram out and say, this is, this is what I do, people, a lot of people sort of know it off the bat. So that's, that's really lovely. How important is that as a freelancer or a creative to have your reputation precede you as a result of winning the prize? It's lovely. It's really nice. And I, um, so I do teaching at the moment for Hand and Lock and a lot of people come on so I tend to pop my Instagram in the chat just so that people can sort of, I think it's nice for people to have a context around the teacher just so that they know what's going on, basically. And a lot of people go, I've seen it. Like, I've seen it at Hands and Lock, and it's, it's a bit of a strange experience when people that you've never met before that, like, will come up to you and be like, I know who you are. It's a bit like, oh, I don't know who you are. But it's quite, <laughs> it's, it's a humbling experience, and it's, it's really, it's such a, like, it's so, so nice just to have people sort of recognise your pieces and tell you that like it's positive feedback really it's like validation yeah it's lovely and what about yourself because i know you're getting commissions and you're getting opportunities to exhibit but people must know lockdown o'clock now they do <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah because it is such a, a strong image i mean you know as a flying clock um time flies tempest fugit etc um but yeah i've, I've had i mean it's a, it is a small embroidery world and you know to feel like you know you're up there a little bit, um, but yeah, you know, so getting into the lift to Hampton Court with somebody, so hi there, and he goes, I know who you are, flying <laughs> clock. <laughs> you know, going, oh, thank you. I have no idea who you are. <laughs> I get called the, uh, the crown woman quite a lot. The crown woman. Oh, yeah. woman. Yeah. 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 I don't know if you find it strange, but I find it weird how something you've made sort of takes on an identity of its own. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes yeah. I'll be on Instagram and it will my work will pop up on someone else's yeah. sort of page if we posted it and that's really lovely but it's also a bit bizarre because you think oh I, I made that and, and it's out um, in the world and they don't know yeah, it, gets, it's, um, it gets its own life and it gets separated from you has, I haven't seen mine for months and months it's been like going from one exhibition to another <laughs> and it's mine's exactly yeah. the same it's yeah. in some office somewhere at the yeah. RSN ready to go into the exhibition opening on Friday and I haven't seen it and the other pieces that are smaller they're just in a box in my flat but they've got this kind of online digital presence that mm. I think without lockdown and without COVID and everything it definitely wouldn't have and mm. I get people kind of resharing it now and I think gosh that was ages ago and but it's kind of the pieces have so much more longevity because people just and people are seeing them for the, like the first time now and that's just something that wouldn't have been possible without COVID. And I think the meaning of an artwork changes as yeah. well over time and that's beyond your control and your scope and that's down yeah. to the people who who, who own it? Because I know your piece is owned by Diana Springle. So she commissioned one based on the pieces themselves. So I did a completely new piece for her, which is going into the Sunbury Gallery collection. So it's really exciting. But yeah, it's kind of... And also people sort of taking it and going, I really like it, but can you do it flat on the sleeve of the shirt? And it's like, yeah, of course I can. So it's kind of how... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of how... It, it has a life of its own and it evolves into new pieces. Like at the moment I'm working with um, a client in a stately home who wants a kind of a replica of it, but through like flora and fauna on a chair, like a Chippendale chair. So it's beautiful to see how these, how it kind of, there's loads of iterations of how it sort of evolves over time. Yeah, it's just a, it's a lovely thing really. Can any of you give me specific examples of things that came about as a result of the prize? Uh, I had a magazine article written about the pieces. Uh, I think it was the Embroidery Guild magazine. Um, lady contacted me sort of out of the blue and said, oh, I saw your pieces at the Hands On Off exhibition and um, I'd love to write an article about them if that's okay. And I said, yeah, by all means. The same thing. So yeah. Each magazine, yeah, they got in touch. And it, there it is on page three. And you had yeah. your cards on display at the yeah. exhibition, very wily. <laughs> Did you get any commissions yeah, so I think my job at the moment came from the prize, really. I think it was kind of, um, I spoke to the kind of staff at Hand and Lock at the time, and I was already doing a bit of teaching, and I think my sort of, it's a new role, and it's, yeah, very exciting, like, absolutely my dream job, and over the moon, but I think it's kind of developing all the new classes and that sort of thing, and it's just, yeah, but I think that the, that originated from the prize. I did a bit of teaching there, and it's sort of, yeah, it's all evolved, and I remember sitting down next to Lucy at the exhibition and marvelling at her perfect nails. You have to, if you go on Instagram, which has got 12,000 followers, 
The nails are always pristine. Now, this is a weird question, but I always found with the embroiderers here at Hand and Lock that if you wanted to take pictures of what they were working on, suddenly there was an air of hand vanity. <laughs> Do you suffer from hand vanity? No, absolutely, absolutely. Like it, it makes me sad if I look at my fingers and they're not pretty. So as soon as I get a chip, I have to redo them. Like no, I don't care. No. No, 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 I think because I play the piano as well, and um, I have to keep my nails really short to do that. And um, I learned piano with acrylic, so I'm not that fan. <laughs> you know what? I, I, I've just finished. Um, uh, teaching a, a class on online, it was like eight classes, and I thought, oh, I really must get my finger here yeah, because obviously the camera's on them and you're teaching that. Um, and I thought, oh, I'll, I'll just get my nails tidying them up a bit, a bit stubby, and then an hour before the class, I managed to like cut a big thing from my of <laughs> So close up, it's like this oozing mess. <laughs> and then the following week, I was drilling something, and it was like a little tiny drill, and managed to burn my other hand. So that's got plaster on. That's got plaster. <laughs> and I had to make all of these movies for ahead of the class, and, uh, and my hands are just covered in plasters. But it was quite nice nails. Well, if nothing <laughs> else, people at home watching know that, you know, <laughs> embroidery is dangerous. It is. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you can like, cut yourself with them sharp scissors, or there's all kinds you of things. You can get your hands short. When, we, you, when we do the classes here, I always try and make sure that oh, this is so, like, it's just not a thing, but I, I try and have a different nail colour for each week, so that if the students are watching the class back, they can see a different colour, so that they know it's a different week, and then it's really sad, but, like, that's kind of, that's just the thing that I tend to do. It's yeah. funny, because I think the world of embroidery is slightly augmented by this digital world that yeah. we live in, where people don't just have an object, they'll know who made it, yeah. they'll know how they made it, they can look at behind-the-scenes videos, so you're not, your one thing isn't just making, you are marketing yourself at yeah. all times, and, and that's where all of this comes into it. Is there a pressure marketing yourself post prize to sort of like sustain a certain level? I think so. I think it's kind of, I think, with especially so, I've, I think my Instagram kind of presence has sort of grown since the prize, and it's knowing that because with Instagram, obviously, it's all about sort of consistency and posting and making sure that you're kind of always online. But obviously, to, to do that, you don't really get a break. So I think it's kind of constantly like I had a chat with um yes the, the other day because it was just like how do I make sure working here full time that I'm basically posting consistently on my Instagram otherwise my followers going to drop off so we've sort of said that we can still post everything and it's all fine so it's kind of making sure that once you've built that profile and once you've, you've gone through all of that self-promotion that it's not just going to drop off the edge of a cliff really. Well that's another point working for mm. big designers going mm. out to New York mm. what can you post what can't you post? Um, so I think it's important, um, you can't post any of your own photos obviously because uh, the company used to be in control of their own sort of brand image and they wouldn't want you sort of posting something from the atelier if it's not sort of ready for social media. Um, so you can, generally the rule is you can put up a photo of uh, something that you've reposted from their Instagram and it's important to specify that you worked as part of a team because mm -hmm. it, hundreds of people go into making a garment from the pattern cutters, the designers, the seamstresses, um, right through to the embroiderers. So obviously you can't say, look what I made. Because <laughs> the, whole thing. the whole thing. Because obviously you're, you, you have to say that I worked as part of a team. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's the general. Well that's, that probably leads me to another question. Do you watch the catwalk shows and goes? I did that bit. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of the best bits in the job. It's exciting, yeah. and obviously you want to make sure nothing's come off. Which is yeah, <laughs> yours is a bit that drops yeah. off on the runway. Oh, no, you don't want that. that. That bottom right bit of beading—that was me. Like, yeah. there's a lot of that that goes on. I think working in hand and lock, I had the opportunity as well years ago when everyone was everyone had to work, even the non-embroiderers like me were taught one thing, and then we had to do it millions of times over. And it was um, it was a dress that was going to be on the X Factor. And and when it came on, I remember running up to the TV going, I did that <laughs> bit of pointing at like the right hip of the dress. That was my bit. I didn't know if it was that feather or another one. But you take immense pride in that, which, you know, I think the reason why I'm mentioning this is that thing about pride is definitely something that the prize hopes you can benefit from, from seeing your piece exhibited or from, from winning. Does that imbue you with more confidence to make you steal forward? Uh, yeah, I think so, definitely. Um, so not back to banking? No, no, definitely not. I was very miserable in banking. Um, I, I think so. It sort of validates your life choices if you've sort of chosen to do something, especially if you've had some pushback from people where they, they don't agree with you doing that as a career. It's nice to say, actually, well, I have, I've done it well. Yeah. <laughs> and it's come on, and it looks great on your... 
easy. Obviously, it's quite an impressive thing to list if you if you've won, you know, any full prize or become a finalist at the Hands and Lock. So, uh, I do definitely think it's. Are there helpful. dancers that you've been able to sort of go see? I mean, I would like to think I'm. I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be quite that blunt with it, but it's it's nice to be able to say actually, you know, you weren't supportive and I have done well yeah. with it. So yeah, it's definitely. Yeah, like, like I had a maths teacher who said that I'd never make it in textiles and you kind of want to it's that petty thing where you kind of want to go see I did do all right yeah <laughs> it's, it's a difficult one though isn't it, from it out is, there? because yeah. we're, we're inside this little world but yeah. out there you know you say oh I'm doing hand embroidery and I go oh that's nice mm-hmm. it's like cross stitch and you know they just got no concept beyond yeah. that of whether like, it could possibly yeah. be some sort like, of career can you my trousers no like, <laughs> <laughs> that's not what it is but I think that's part of the mission of Hand and Lock and particularly Hand and Lock's prize is to try and broaden the audience and, and bring people mm-hmm. and then educate you know grab them and then explain to them this is hand this is machine yeah, this yeah. takes this long this is precious metal and I know from last year's prize exhibition that there were people that came in quite spuriously I think mm. and then they were leaving going saying how they had learnt so much and they mm. had no idea that these things existed or that it would take so long and I, I really personally enjoy that but you mm. must all of you must encounter people who say how much when you quote them yeah. for work mm. Mm. I think it's a double edged sword really mm. because I think it's when you're a handybody, you have to accept that your job is a bit odd. It's, it's yeah. unusual. There's not many of us. Um, but then that's why we are able to do it for a living, because there aren't many of us, and it's a very specialist skill. So I personally never mind if people say, you do what? And, and like ask questions. It's sort of only once you've explained, if they're still sort of a bit, Condescending. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, 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 fine. <laughs> it's an odd sentence, isn't it, when you say, I'm hand embroiderer at the Royal School of Needlework at Hampton Court Palace, and you can't say it without people being like, What? That's the same. You're in a palace? Yeah. <laughs> Do you get to live with Henry VIII? It's just like, you know. <laughs> um, Actually, well, that kind of brings me to the entrants that are entering now, and remember, you have until midnight tomorrow. The entrants that are entering now, you're going to see their work. You know about the brief. What what would you, let's start with you, what would you say to someone in a similar position to you, perhaps, who's changing career, who wants to enter the prize, what advice would you give them? Do it. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> um, in terms of the brief, um, here's, here's how I approached it. Um, is that I'm used to um, reading briefs here. You know, back in the day, as a graphic designer, you would always have a brief or something, and it's always very um, love a brief. Explanation, love a brief, you know. So, so I'll look at the brief and then see how I can like kind of push its boundaries and sort of still fulfil it, but you know, then over uh, what's the word over. Well, over deliver. Yeah. Well, there's something that they yeah. say about a brief. Read the brief and read the subtext, mm. yes. and give the person what they don't know they want. Mm. Yes, yes. Also, I mean, if you don't quite under because an artistic brief is in a, a language that can appear a bit impenetrable. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so what I did was actually rewrote it down in, into sentences, bullet points mm-hmm. that I could understand. Um, so I could then come back to it, look at it, and let it just kind of absorb it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I knew I understood it. I knew which part of it my piece of work was fulfilling. Janus, for example. Does, yes, Janus, Janus time. But also, you know, it has a little movie on there, so that, like, zooms straight into the digital world. So, yeah, so, and that's, that's what, so, yeah, do, don't worry about anything. I mean, take it, I mean, read the brief and, until, till it speaks to you. Take it apart, you know, read it upside down, whatever it is. And then ju- just follow the nagging voice in your head <laughs> that's saying, yeah. why should I do this? I'd be interested to know about overcoming nerves and mm-hmm. doubts because I think you probably had the most tumultuous journey to your mm-hmm. prize. I think my main advice would be don't be sensible um, like with your scale or your idea um, because when you work in hand embroidery it's very rare that you get to make something that's completely in your control because if you're doing a commission you obviously have a client to think about if you're working for a big company you're obviously fulfilling someone else's vision so to be able to be just given a brief and say make whatever you like 
I think is really unusual and it's a rare thing. And so I think sometimes doubts can think, oh, no, I won't make that. That'll be too difficult or I'm not sure how to do it. And I would just say, just don't be sensible and try and make something ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't work, then you've got time to sort of scale it around and work out what you can do. Now, you say that, but Mm -hmm. I know the people at Hand and Lock have a terrifying fear that one day someone will embroider a car (laughs) and they'll have to find a way of displaying it and storing it. So please don't be sensible. (laughs) Please also don't embroider a car. (laughs) Um, I think it's quite interesting that when you um, approach the prize, you, for want of a better word, mind your family mm. and you kind of went to that personal place that's also shared with other people mm. and there are personal stories in there about your grandfather yeah. and your nana. Um, what advice would you give to people who are entering the prize this year but feel that they, they're looking at their families for inspiration? Is it a safe thing to do? I think it definitely is as long as you're not overtly insulting anyone. I think as long as you're kind of going down a sort of I explored it and what, what's precious to me and that's kind of the the whole inspiration behind it and the colour schemes for each of the pieces were inspired by kind of childhood photos that I had and it was just a really beautiful project and it was kind of my way of sort of saying thank you to them for just being men basically because they, they'd been so incredibly supportive over the pandemic and just kind of just put up with so much because obviously it's like literally had to move back in to my house with all of my stuff from uni. How awful. (laughs) (laughs) But I remember, I just like tend to just leave threads everywhere because obviously when you're working it just kind of creates this mess of embroidery and I remember my dad walking into the lounge and he was just walking around picking up beads on his feet. He was like, why is there sparkly gravel all over the lounge floor? And I was like, I'm sorry. Beads, (laughs) sparkly gravel, that's the new name for them. Sparkly gravel and he like came in from the toilet and was like, why is this thread on the toilet floor? I was like, I'm sorry sorry like it's just it's just you just got to put up with it and even when I go home now and I have a commission there's like a corner of the lounge he's like oh the carpet's gone again all these stuff's just all like piled up on the floor but I think it's my way of sort of saying thank you to them for putting up with the sparkly gravel really and just being just just literally I I don't look back on lockdown as a tough time I look back on it as a really special time that I just got to spend with my family and yeah they're my best mates so That's yeah nice. so I think enjoy the process yeah, part of exactly. that and, and if you are um, creating something inspired by your surroundings and your family and your loved ones expect mess yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the brief for 2022 this prize is the new nature um, embellished design in harmony with nature so this is really all about looking at the plant world looking for inspiration from nature to create embroidery Essentially, the the subtext here is embroidery and the environment. Mm. Some people would often argue that embroidery is, by its very nature, wasteful, decadent and superfluous, and therefore something we shouldn't be doing. We should all be walking around in utilitarian clothes with no buttons that we don't need to save the planet. Mm -hmm. But others might argue that embroidery adds value and makes people want to hang on to things for longer. Obviously, I'm, I'm mainly talking here in terms of fashion Mm -hmm. but I just wondered from an environmental perspective if if you guys had considered that in your previous works definitely I think it's something that everyone's so mindful of it's such a kind of um buzzword at the moment sustainability and just trying to make sure that everything that you're doing is conscious of the environment and ethically produced and I think with my pieces I used put a little ad out on Instagram and was like does anybody want to kind of does anybody got any stuff lying around that they're never going to use and I got so many threads and so many beads and things from people that just weren't weren't using them and then obviously I'm not having to buy new and I think with gold work as well not not using the precious metals using the imitation metals to reduce the need for the mining of the materials and things like that it's just producing things in a, in a sort of sustainable, sustainably minded way and also making sure, I think embroidery as a practice is fairly sustainably minded because it's a slow form of production and I think if anything it adds longevity to the pieces mm-hmm. because you're adding value and you don't, it's not something that kind of goes out with the next season, I don't think hand embroidery is ever something that people sort of tend to chuck away so I think it's, as a practice as a whole, I think it's a fairly sustainable yeah, sustainable method of production. I would say, yeah, the same is it's almost opposite to the fast fashion, which I think is the most environmentally damaging mm-hmm. because it takes so many hours to hand embroider something. The cost of it is inherently high. And if someone's prepared to pay sort of thousands of pounds for something, I don't can't imagine it's hopefully we'll be going into landfill yeah. anytime soon. Oh, um, queen on that <laughs> <landfill. laughs> <laughs> um, There's such a good range of both synthetic and um, 
sort of non-synthetic materials that you can use as well depending on the project and they are designed to last so I do think it's if anything it's the opposite of mm. sort of the issue with fashion. Well it, there's another element to sustainability which I think we ultimately forget a lot of the time because we see it through this prism of the environment but sustainability means it should be more cost effective mm -hmm. and easier for you to do as a, as a business you know if you have sustainable practices they're sustainable from a business point of view as well as from an environmental point of view most times as people who run your own businesses is sustainability that is it serving your business needs as well as your environmental needs i would say absolutely yes um the I would say like your example yeah. of actually sourcing materials from mm. people you know yes perfect that's really of cost yeah effect. absolutely um so um so the, the the latest kit i did which was actually a box a little tudor house um I'm trying to adopt the just-in-time method for that, but also knowing how many kits I'm imagining I'm going to make from it, and then just ordering just enough for that. Mm -hmm. um, the bespoke fabrics I designed were printed in Britain, so they've come from Manchester, I think it is. So uh, I was just trying to say, and the packaging, um, I just recycled the inordinate number of Amazon boxes that have come through my yeah. door, you know, they're, they're, they've all been cut into A4 by me, you know, and they're, and they're used as packaging for it. So I've, I've done my best. Um, uh, there are, uh, obviously there are certain amounts of, you, know, you think, oh, these threads are coming from probably Germany, you know, so what, what yeah. can I do? I, I, I do yeah. my best. Yeah. 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 What we were talking about earlier in terms of social media and the hand embroidery, I think that's the only way, it's, it's tricky to maintain a sustainable situation on social media because it takes such a long time and it's such a slow process I think embroidery and social media I think is the one thing that I think it's difficult to sustain it online because I think people social media it's click you want it instantly it's that kind of thing rather than hand embroidery which is such a slow process and I think maintaining that I don't know if you do have found this but I think it's just kind of there's you, you need content to post consistently but to create the content it takes weeks yeah. so yeah, I think time lapses. Yes, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Think, oh, I don't want to put that up yet yeah. because it's you know, not quite finished or yeah. it's part of something else. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> I should mention now, actually, while I remember that if you have any questions for any of the panelists, you can write them in the comment section on YouTube underneath the video now, and we'll get them. I think in we'll probably start on questions in a few minutes, actually. So if you've got some questions, write them down. Um, I was thinking about the entrance for this year following that brief. And I know you guys have done it, you've been there, you've created something, but thinking about the brief, what you, are you hoping to see from them this year? What would excite you? I think we're all coming from a stunt like perspective, so I think we'd all, <laughs> <laughs> we'd yeah, all love to see a bit, of, um, yeah, a, a bit of 3D embroidery would be smashing, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I always think embroidery takes on a new life when it's 3D. It's beautiful, mm -hmm. flat, obviously, but that is sort of traditional, and I think when it takes on a 3D aspect it just comes to life more yeah, so I'd love to see some 3D. So definitely with a stunt yeah. one. <laughs> what about from a conceptual perspective if people are looking not just to the environment for inspiration but looking to the environment to um, solve, sorry looking for their embroidery to solve a problem how would they address that conceptually or what would you like to see? Like to see. Well as it happens the um, the, the current third years, the Future Shoes programme at the RSN, I've kind of talked to them all about what they're doing, mm. and they're all in this now. I am going to be so excited to see what they've done, because, in fact, I better not say, actually, because <laughs> it's, it's their ideas. But, um, but yeah, the, there's um, one of them is actually gathering lots of threads from wherever they can um, source mm. them, that are you, and so they're... Um, not quite recycling, but giving another life mm -hmm. to that to that work. Um, oh, and there's another one doing the other idea I had, <laughs> which is <laughs> it, it was, well, sorry, we, sorry, probably both thought of it at the same time. I should say, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm absolutely so excited to see um, what that particular student's going to be doing. I think textile artists as well and embroiderers are sort of inherently drawn to like used as a second-hand mm -hmm. fabric, and where somebody might look at something and think, oh there's a mark or there's a hole in that I think a textile artist or an embroiderer would think oh what can I fill that up with and so if you look at artists like Celia Pym her work's all sort of based around damage to her fabric and, and darning and I think that 
is, is something that would be lovely to see incorporated into sort of this year's brief because it would fit really nicely. And I don't know about you guys, but I've sampled on cut up tablecloths, pillowcases, yeah, well, we the, random um, bits of art. We did the Etorts collection with Celia Pym, so Patrick Grant's kind of, I can't remember which um, tailor it was for, but we did his collection and all of it was kind of mending and there was suits with holes in and he basically went to landfill and sourced a load of jeans. Clean it. We got them when they weren't clean. It was a bit we like didn't oh, find any McQueen at the landfill. We didn't find any McQueen <laughs> at the landfill, but um, yeah, they all got cleaned and then we all worked on them. And th- yeah, they were really beautiful pieces. And that was a whole catwalk collection based on sustainability and mending. So I think that would be something kind of making that cool again. Mm-hmm. I think is something that's so important. And if that was there, I think that would be a nice thing yeah, to see. Exactly. The mending is very cool. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I think as well. It's not a new thing at all. You know, this idea of repairing what you already have was always there. And I still don't think we've reached the same levels that we used to have. I mean, it it hasn't occurred to me ever to get a pair of shoes repaired, whereas I'm quite certain with my parents, there wasn't a pair of shoes that wasn't repaired. Um, But we're just slightly set up differently. But hopefully we're getting better. And briefs like this might steer people more towards thinking about how they can be more sustainable. And people in the past as well have entered the prize and recycled their wedding dinner. You know, the feast, this is an entry from a few years ago, I'm sure you can look them up online, who, um, who after their wedding, everything from that scene was turned into a dress. Even the skin of the fish, the leaves from the wow. tree, the, the, the tablecloth. Yeah. And that was, that's a very, very creative endeavour, but also something that's meaningful, but really proves everything can be recycled. The mm-hmm. skin of a fish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have some questions Ooh. that have been sent through. So... This is from Masha to all speakers. Thank you, Masha. How do you cope with failures? Do the troubles motivate you or discourage you? Failures? There's never a failure. (laughs) What about in life? Oh, in life. What's your approach in life? And then let's narrow it down to professional embroidery. (laughs) Failures, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I do suffer if I fail, I must admit. (laughs) I'll be quite crushed. Um... Now, you've got to pick yourself up and just mm-hmm. start again. You know, life, life is too short to sit around, like, moping about things that might have been. You know, it's just, just, um, just get on with it. You know, yeah. Yeah, I think it's my opinion. You know, you, um, it's like keeping a positive yeah. mental attitude and yeah. perspective yeah, yeah, yeah. on things. And obviously, at the beginning, it's like throw yourself a little pity party for two days and just, yeah. like, have a big cry about it if you need to. But then... It's just get straight back on the horse, really, and mm. that's the way that I would do it. And I think, especially with embroidery, I remember that I sliced through a tamper frame by accident, and it was my spent absolutely ages on it, sliced through it, and it's just like, yes, have a big cry about it because it's a load of weight that you've missed, just frame up and start again. Like, mm-hmm. there's no point. Failure yeah. no with embroidery is, ju- is just sampling. That's exactly, it and it's yeah, only embroidery, and you're not saving <laughs> lives, like, it's, it is just sewing. Exactly, yeah. yeah. You're yeah. not saving lives, we yeah. hear that a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What about yourself? Have you professionally experienced failures that have motivated you? Um, yeah, I mean, everybody makes mistakes. I, but I think it's how you deal with the mistakes that is important. You know, if you've, if you've accidentally messed something up at work or at home, then I think it's important to own up to it and not sort of try and pretend it's someone else. I think yeah. it's important to say, oh, actually, yes, that was me, and uh, this is what I'm going to do mm-hmm. to fix it. And I think especially if you're working at home and you're dealing with your own projects, I think your project's better if things haven't worked Mm -hmm. initially because it has more depth. You go off maybe on a tangent that you hadn't thought about. I don't think the journey of a project is linear. I think you should bounce backwards Mm -hmm. and forwards, up and down. And it took me quite a long time to get to that. I know when I first started uni, if something didn't go right or I didn't like it, I'd throw it away. Mm. And that's a terrible habit. And it used to drive my tutors up the wall because I'd just throw it in the bin. And it'd be gone forever. And although it might not work for that project, it's an important part of it. And you might come back to it for another project or later down the line. So I think things go wrong. It's it's fine. I think perfectionism you know, can't be. It's quite toxic, really, isn't yeah. it? I mean, if you're embroidery, you know what you're trying to create. Most of the time, you know, mm-hmm. is as perfect mm-hmm. as humanly. And if something is out of place. You know, you can blow it up out of proportion mm. into... Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, this is maybe a different level of pressure for the entrants this coming year, but they're being judged by new judges from last year, including Cornelia Parker, the artist, um, and Philip Tracy and Anthea Godfrey. I want to augment that last question from Masha. How would it feel to be judged by people like that 
and fail. This is an imagination question. I, I know it's a tough one. Yeah. You're, yeah. A yeah. Yeah. you're a failure. Failure is the wrong word. You're yeah. not failing. I don't think there's a fail. I think any feedback, obviously, there's a constructive way of wording it, so I take that the tutors would be <laughs> nice about it, but I think it's kind of, and obviously they would be so really lovely people, but I think it's just kind of taking it and constructive criticism is never it's never a bad thing ever mm. and I think we, there's always room for improvement so I think it's just never taking constructive criticism as a negative and it's never personal like in, within the embroidery world like it's, if it's about your work you use it to professionally develop yourself rather than kind of it, it's not a personal attack like it's fine yeah just kind of go with it then do you think if the person who's giving you that feedback is someone you really respect like mm. Philip Tracy, for example, and you are thinking to yourself, oh my God, this person's opinion really matters mm. to me. Does that impact you differently? I, I, I wouldn't say it impacts you differently. I think it has more like gravitas and you would take it very seriously because you really admire the person. Um, but I think feedback from anyone, whether it's someone who's sort of at the top of their field or someone who's never looked at a bit of embroidery before, I think mm. it has positives and negatives in both, in both ways. So. Yeah. I think from my experience, the people who you maybe respect the most are the people who you know know the most about mm-hmm. what you're doing. You know, anyone can come along and go, oh, that's pretty. Mm-hmm. But if someone knows it technically and understands it and looks at the back, because we all know mm-hmm. if you're a real expert in embroidery, you're looking at the back. Mm-hmm. And they look at the back and then they say, this is skillful. Mm-hmm. This is magnificent. That's where you're like, oh. I think yeah. if someone's work you admire as well, if, if they then, then you've sort of looked at their work, you think, oh, that's one, like, amazing, that's wonderful, and then for them to say something positive about yours is, is really lovely. Yeah. I think it's breaking yeah. it down in your head and just being like, they are human beings as well. Like, I think uh, within the embroidery world, like, especially like Karen Nicholl and people that I met at the embroidery exhibition, I was so starstruck, and you, know, and you kind of like, I can't, I was just sat there, like, I don't really know what to say. I was like, I don't want to like, sound all weird, and I don't know, you kind of overthink everything, but then sort of took myself, gave myself a stern talking to it, it was like, they're human beings, like, same as you, like, it's, they're, they're there to have a conversation with you, and they're there to help you, so don't take it, yeah, it's just sort of like, it's an interaction. I really hope Karen Nichol doesn't watch, but I was back at <laughs> a talk with her recently, I had Diana Springle on my left, and Karen Nichol on the right, and I was like, <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> and then I was just like, we're just here for the talk, but I'm like, I have uh, I have another question here. I think we've we've covered this a little bit, but I think maybe I don't know if has anyone entered the prize before and not got through or talked themselves out of entering. I've entered the year before I won this year and didn't enter and didn't win anything. Because I've got a question here. Any advice on overcoming the fear of entering the conversation? This person talks himself out every year, and that's horrible to hear. Just, just I think what's the, yeah. what's the worst that can happen? Yeah, exactly. yeah. Entered, yeah. I entered the year before, um, and my piece got selected for the RSN award, um, and then my house fire happened, so I didn't. It didn't sort of go any further than that. But so that's the worst that could happen. <laughs> <laughs> but it's to, to enter a competition and not get selected to go any further, it's not a failure. It's no, it's a, no, a lesson. It's all, yeah, it's yeah, good experience yeah. for the future. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I applied for the future shoot the first time, I was I got turned down that year, but I applied again the next year, and I was in. So, and as it turned out, it was, it was absolutely. Um, the best thing that happened here yeah, because they're really good on that year that I didn't get in. <laughs> so maybe if you're talking yourself out legitimately, yeah. then you know maybe it isn't the time for you. But yeah. fight in that voice. Yeah. I would, I would yeah. wonder why. Like, what what is the reason that you're talking yourself out of it? Like, is it because you don't think that your work is good enough to get everyone else's? Um, but I mean everyone's work so individual, and I find this when I teach a class, everyone's obsessed with trying to make their piece identical to mm. the example and I always say no don't do that like mm-hmm. make it your own like make it different colour make it different scale and someone might be really neat and other people might have more like fluid loose mm. pictures it doesn't mean one way is right it's just that's the whole point is individuality mm. well in painting we went from this era of rational realism in the renaissance to impressionism mm. where people started doing impasto making mm-hmm. smearing the colours not painting the detail and I think more people prefer that kind of art because it is more of an expression neatness and precision mm-hmm. we've got mm-hmm. photos for that so yeah. if you're learning embroidery 
loosen up a little bit and um, and the whole point is it's not, it's not done by a machine it's done by yeah. hands and it's mm. you can tell that it's been done by a hand yeah. that's that's the whole point I think as well I think all three of us are all pretty kind of if you want to sort of message us after this and if you want any sort of advice on a specific person or that well I'm, I mean I'm personally definitely more than willing to give that because I think yeah definitely don't put yourself out there because it's like the worst that can happen is that you get an email that's like you haven't got in you just fly, fly again the next year yeah. Like, it's, yeah. it's fine yeah it's not not a big deal I'm going to take one last question and then I think we'll wrap it up. Um, what advice would you give to new people entering the field? How do you make embroidery a sustainable career? So you're all, this is your main mm-hmm. income yeah. now. That's a big, scary step. Was the one thing that you might have done that just made that a bit easier? I would say don't pigeonhole yourself. Um, so when I started university, if you said to me, what's the one field you don't want to go into? I said fashion. I said I don't want to do it at all. Um, but it turns out that it's actually one of my favourite areas to work in. So I think if you're too... Because our career is unusual and most of us are freelance, we've got sort of our fingers in lots of pies, if that makes sense. And if you pigeonhole yourself too much and you're like, no, I only do interiors or no, I only do... Um, you know, fashion, I think you sort of naturally limit yourself on so many opportunities. Do you think there's a fear of saying no? I do, yeah, I, I don't think, I, that's the advice that I would give, is never say no to anything, because yeah. I think even if you do, I've done some bonkers things, like I remember I was stood in the rain putting on dried flowers onto a hessian blanket in the middle of Chelsea um, on these two massive life-size, like dream. literally yeah. on these two massive like life-size antique elephants. And there was press there, and I looked like a drowned rat. And it's, that was one that, but that whole project was a beautiful project. And eventually, it's it's earned me so much from it, and I gained so much from it. And the team I worked with were just so lovely. And I think it's just like never say no. If someone says make two eight meter eight meter blankets for or four meter blankets for these elephants. Initially, my thought process was like, oh my gosh, absolutely not. That's too hard. But just just do it. And I think just never say no to anything. Initially, you're just sort of getting started, and then w- once you sort of get a, a more of a reputation, you can then start start to sort of being more selective. But I think, especially when you're starting out, yeah, just take every single opportunity that you can possibly get and enter everything you can possibly do. Like, definitely, definitely enter the prize. Yeah, I would also say don't make things for free. Yeah. You get so yeah. many messages and no, people yeah. saying, you know, well, we'll do it. if you do this, you can have exposure. Or, and um, my advice would be just don't don't do it. It never is. I would know. say that's the fine line, though. The idea yeah. that you should never say no. You mm-hmm. should accept mm-hmm. every project, but also know your worth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I find that as a freelance writer as well. That you know, the word exposure. I'm 40 years old. I don't need exposure. I need to pay my mortgage. Exposure doesn't pay the bill. Exactly. I can't eat exposure. (laughs) Well, in terms of of a career, I mean, absolutely true. I mean, say yes to your universe. Mm. Um, uh, The the Royal School of Needlework, I mean, apart from fashion, I mean, they have a professional studio. Mm. um, And uh, so... So what they're doing, they're creating new embroideries, new works. They're doing conservation of textiles. Um, and also, I mean, pe- people are sending in their treasured um, sort of family heirlooms, you know, to, to be, you know, spruced up and hoovered and uh, remounted and that sort of thing. So, I mean, th- that is like, you know, fantastic work. You know, it's it's beautiful. It's, 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 it is professional. It's working that way. So it's not all about just me and my, you know, sort of, you know, great embroidery stuff that I'm putting out there and hoping people are going to buy it or, or hire me, etc. Yeah. So, th- so there is a whole other side to that, um, to the the industry, yeah. if you like. Industry, I thought, yeah. quite right the word, really, yeah. is it? For well, embroidery I, think it I think it's right, and I think yeah. it's also finding the appropriate place to advertise your work. Mm-hmm. I think sites like Etsy are maybe great if you're more craft orientated, but if you're making sort of really densely embroidered pieces that cost thousands of pounds sort of advertising them maybe on Etsy is not the right forum no, for you so I think sense. definitely finding the right place in the market for whatever you're making is important that definitely helps. I think as all what you were saying in terms of not being pigeonholed like the world of embroidery is so unbelievably big that you can't 
I think w- until you're in it, you can't really appreciate the sort of kind of the, the many facets of, the, of mm-hmm. within the embroidery world. It's film, costume, restoration, conservation. I, I can't even name them. I'm not even going to try because I feel like that's just yeah. a pointless task. But yeah. But all of you as well have supplemented what you do with teaching and with courses. Yeah. So I think there's a degree of being versatile yeah, as well so yeah. don't say no yeah. don't mm-hmm. pigeonhole yourself yeah. mm-hmm. know your worth yeah. mm-hmm. be versatile mm-hmm. and um, I think on that I'm, I've got one last question mm-hmm. it's one word mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so Pressure. this is like fingers on buzzers <laughs> um, I really want you to summarise in one word your prize experience starting with you Kate <laughs> <laughs> so you said one word. Yeah, it was, it was like wow. wow. Yes. I would say confidence. It's made me more confident in my work. That's really nice to hear. Mm. I would say happiness. Happiness. Mm. Should we return to see if we can get more than? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take their two words. Perfect. So it sounds like the entering the prize is definitely a worthwhile experience. It's useful in terms of developing a freelance career. Um, and if anyone at home is wanting to enter, uh, remember, oh, I've got it here somewhere, if you want to go online and enter, you've got until uh, midnight tomorrow night, the 31st of March, and code ROUNDTABLE22 will get you 30% off. Um, all that's left is for me to thank my lovely guests. Congratulations again on all winning things <laughs> and everything that came after that. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Thank you, and thank you for having us. Thank you.